cooking those store-bought stocks uh, really do impart an unusual flavor to your food that you don't realize unless you're used to having homemade stocks. And one of the great premises about uh, making stocks is that it's an opportunity for you to use leftovers during your week of cooking um, so that you're not wasting any of your uh, produce or market items as you're making dinners. So typically uh, when I'm cooking, I will uh, save a bowl or a Ziploc bag of scraps, um, parsley trimmings, the bottoms of celery, um, trimmings from onions, even the scrapings from carrots. All of this stuff can be saved to use when making a stock. And today we're going to uh, go over the process for making a beef stock, uh, a traditional chicken stock, and also a vegetable stock. The ingredients that are needed in making a stock uh, are your basic mirepoix, which is onions, carrots, and celery. I also use shallots in mine. Um, for the vegetable stock, you're going to want to have some mushrooms in that. The mushroom is going to impart a really warm, earthy flavor to your vegetable stock. Uh, leeks or leek trimmings are great to add to a stock. Um, garlic, also the skins and the bottoms of garlic is great to add. When you're making stock, you, you want to use the skin and everything for the stock. So you don't want to throw away any of this stuff. It's about using all the scraps and the skins are going to add a great uh, color and a little bit more flavor to your stocks as well. Uh, fresh thyme, some bay leaves. For the beef stock, you're going to want to have some tomato paste, which we're going to roast on the bones. Uh, you're going to have marrow bones for the beef stock. A marrow bone can be found in your uh, grocery store. These are usually found uh, frozen in the freezer section and they come in packs. So the butcher, when he gets the meat, just uh, cuts the bones up and packages them. Uh, and for six or seven dollars, you get a package of bones. And you want to make sure when you're making beef stock that you are getting marrow bones. That's how they'll be labeled. So these are filled with marrow, and as this cooks for several hours, the marrow is just going to melt away into the stock, and that's what's going to give it its gelatinous um, texture in order for you to be able to create rich soups and uh, thick sauces with. And then also a whole chicken that we're going to actually segment because we only want to use the carcass of it, not the meat or the skin and also some red wine for your beef stock uh, for the deglazing. And it should be a, a full-bodied wine like a Cabernet Sauvignon. It doesn't have to be an expensive bottle, but it should be a heartier variety uh, of wine. So let's get started making our beef stock. The first step in making beef stock is we need to roast the marrow bones to give them a nice, rich, dark, uh, golden color before putting them in a stock pot to boil them down. So I'm gonna place these in a roasting pan. I'm gonna drizzle them with just a little bit of olive oil and I'm gonna add some onion and carrots to it. Now remember when you're adding your vegetables, you're gonna add all this right into the pot. The skins are going to impart some extra flavor and it's also going to help to create a more of a rich, uh, delicious looking stock. I'm only going to add the onions and the carrots to start with because they can take quite a bit of roasting and they'll 
get a really nice flavor out of that. Towards the end of the roasting process, when I put the tomato paste on top of the bones to roast that, I will also add the celery and the garlic. And again, not worrying about peeling the carrots. These are washed, but we're gonna use the ends and we're just gonna cut them into some thick pieces. Because this stock is going to cook on the stove for about six to eight hours, um, these carrots can be in larger pieces. It'll have enough time to render all of the flavor out of them. Into the oven it goes, and we're gonna get started prepping for our chicken stock. And so the first part of making the chicken stock is you really just want to use the carcass uh, to make the stock. We don't want any of the skin or the meat. Remove all of the skin from the chicken. And I'm being careful not to cut into any of the meat. And usually when I'm making a chicken stock, just so that I'm not wasting it, uh, I will make dinner that night out of the actual meat of the chicken as the stock is cooking. Chicken stock is different than making soup, right? In soup, you want definitely the carcass, but you usually would always have the meat added into that. And in a stock, you really don't. A stock should be a very mild flavored liquid that you can build upon your flavoring with. And because I do want as much bone in there as possible, I am gonna trim out the thigh bone to be able to put in there. And the nice part about doing this is that if you do remove this bone, you can actually stuff this piece of chicken with some stuffing. So this bone is actually gonna go into my stock. And I'm gonna leave the skin on for these thighs, just trim a little bit. And this can actually be stuffed with some stuffing and that makes a delicious meal the night that your chicken stock is cooking. And then the rest of the skin we're gonna take off of the chicken. The skin contains a lot of impurities that you don't want in your stock. What you're really trying to get is not the fat, but the collagen that's in uh, the bones. Okay, so now we've got the chicken carcass. We're gonna set that right in the middle of our stock pot. And we are also gonna add our onions and I'm gonna add some shallots to it because chicken only takes about four to six hours uh, to complete, you wanna cut your vegetables a little bit smaller in order to render out all of the flavor out of them. And the amount of carrots and celery should equal, combined, the amount of onion that you have in there. So to this, we're gonna add two carrots and two stalks of celery and that. And I'm going to add some garlic to mine. Again, I'm going to add the skin and everything. Just peel off some pieces of garlic. I'm going to add some tops to some leeks because I'm going to use these leeks uh, in my chicken for my chicken dish for dinner. Some parsley. We're going to want some fresh thyme and also a bay leaf. So with all that in there, we're gonna fill this up to about a uh, little more than three quarters of the way with water. We're gonna set that on the stove to simmer for about six to eight hours. Um, and it should simmer at a very, very low temperature. So it should only lightly bubble, not boil. This is a very slow process. Okay, so now we're going to prepare our vegetable stock. Again, this is only gonna cook for about three to four hours at the most um, because we're only cooking down vegetables. So I tend to cut these vegetables even smaller in order to be able to render out the most amount of flavor out of them. So I'm gonna add some leek, uh, some onion, and some shallots to it. You don't have to add all of that. It, it can just be onion. Uh, but I, I like the flavor that all the different onions impart in my vegetable stock. 
This is the easiest stock to make, probably the quickest one. Um, but it's really good to have vegetable stock on hand. Uh, I like to make my risottos with a vegetable stock. I find it to be much lighter and uh, a lot less chickeny tasting. And again, we're going to use the skin and all. The skin's going to give it a nice golden color when it boils. We are going to add some mushrooms to it. The mushrooms are going to give it a nice, deep, warm, earthy flavor. I'm going to put two carrots in it. You don't want to go too heavy with the carrots because you don't want it to be super sweet tasting. The carrots are going to impart a very sweet flavor. I will do two stalks of celery. Uh, we are going to put in some whole garlic cloves along with the skin. A bunch of fresh thyme, a hearty amount of parsley. and two bay leaves. We are going to set our pot on the stove and get this to start to simmer. You can see the chicken stock is simmering on the stove at this point. It is a very, very light, low simmer. This is not a fast cooking process. This is a very slow cooking process. So you really don't want it simmering anything more than a few bubbles bubbling up around the pot. And that is it. Anything more than that, you're cooking it too quickly. It takes a very long, slow process to render out all of that uh, collagen out of the bones and the flavoring. As your chicken stock uh, is simmering, you're going to notice a lot of white impurities coming up on uh, the top of the stock pot. And Every so often, you just want to take a ladle and very lightly skim that off. You want to let your chicken stock simmer along with your vegetable stock. And when we get to that point, along with your beef stock, uncovered. You do not want to cover these when you're simmering them. You want to allow the liquid to reduce down. We're going to now check on our beef stock. These bones are really starting to brown up nicely. I'm just going to flip them over. You can also see it's starting to caramelize on the bottom of the pan. You don't want to char the bones. You want to make sure they're really nice and caramelized. So if you find that they might be overcooking, just turn your oven down a little bit. I like to start roasting these on 400 degrees, um, but sometimes I have to turn it down midway through just so that they don't burn. So these are about halfway through the process um, of caramelizing. And uh, at this stage, we're going to go ahead and add the tomato paste and the garlic and the celery. And it's probably going to roast for about another 20 minutes till it gets really nice and caramelized. And then we're going to end up deglazing it. And you can see how beautiful. See the marrow? It's all breaking apart and rendering down. That's what's going to give this beef stock a tremendous amount of flavor. And so we're just going to smear on some tomato paste. I'm going to add the rest of the vegetables. They're going to get a little bit of a roast in the oven. And then uh, for about another 20 minutes, we'll deglaze this. And then we will add it to our stock pot. I'm going to scoop these out and put them in our pot. And then we're going to deglaze this pan with some red wine. And you just want to scrape the bottom of all the bits, all that great flavor that's in there. I think I've got everything deglazed off the bottom. The wine will reduce as we cook it down in the pot. And we're going to put this in the sink. It's always best to pour things out in the sink. This way, if it drops, it's not going on your floor. Look how nice and rich that looks. And so I'm going to add some of our scraps to this because I, I don't want to waste them. I don't want to put too many in, though. I also add some black uh, peppercorns 
to my beef stock to give it a little bit of a spicy flavor. Some fresh thyme, some fresh parsley, and some tap water. We're all set to strain our vegetable stock and cool it down. It's very important when you're making stocks that you have uh, a bowl set inside of another bowl with ice around it. That's gonna help cool the stock down very quickly. And you just wanna place a strainer. I line mine with paper towels. You can do uh, cheesecloth, but paper towels are handy and it works just as well. But you wanna strain all of everything out of the stock so that all that you have left is just the liquid. And so you're very carefully just gonna pour this in. I wanna extract as much of that juice as I can. And this is the same way that you will strain the chicken stock and the beef stock when it finishes. And you wanna use your paper towel to actually push out the juices. And look at the nice, beautiful caramel color that we've achieved with our vegetable stock. Your cooled stock is gonna be very gelatinous. So it's gonna be liquidy, but it's gonna have a gelatinous feeling to it. That's from all the gelatin that's in the bones. And the first thing that you wanna do is skim off all this fat. You don't wanna keep any of that in your stock. And if you swirl your spoon in the middle of the stock very lightly, it'll push all of the fat out to the edge that you can scoop it out. We're gonna do the same with the chicken stock. Just carefully peel this off. And you can see how gelatinous this chicken stock is. It's a nice, dark, rich chicken stock very mild in flavor, but very flavorful. So to package these, I like to do two different things. I like to put them in ice cube trays because it really helps when you just need to pop one out to make a quick sauce and you're not wasting a whole container of chicken stock. And the other one is these um, disposable ice cream containers or soup containers. These are a one cup measure, uh, so it's perfect for when you're doing recipes and it calls for one or two cups of chicken stock or beef stock, you can just pull one or two of these out of the freezer and thaw them and you have it already pre-measured for you. So we're gonna continue to fill our uh, ice cube trays and our containers with our stock and get those into the freezer. It does not take a lot of effort to make stocks. It takes a little bit of time, you can let them simmer all day long as you're working around the house um, and even through eating dinner so that by the time the evening comes, they're ready to be strained and refrigerated. It's a great way for you to not have to buy store-bought uh, stocks all of the time and with just a little bit of effort, uh, your dishes will come out tremendously well as well. Thanks for joining me and we will see you at the Q&A. Are we on? Hey. Hi, Rhonda. Hey, everybody. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Um, today, I hope you enjoyed the video. We have Rhonda Carmen here, and I made some notes because uh, she is so enterprising and has done so much, and I really admire that. So I want to give you a little bit of a, the list of what she's done. She is the author of two books, um, Entertaining at Home, which is a fabulous book about entertaining, and Designers at Home. Um, she hosts a cooking club on Facebook, and she is starting a new podcast called At Home in the Kitchen. And she's also um, Solinaire's 2019 recipient um, of the, on the list of the 100 best hosts in America. Um, so I'm so happy to have you here, Rhonda. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And um, for having I, me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I really love the idea when we were talking that, you know, I'm a professionally trained cook, so I went to cooking school, um, but you did not. And we sort of, sort of share a love of um, making stocks. And I think as a self-taught cook, you also understand the importance of the foundation of having a stock. So 
can you tell me a little bit about why you like to make them and what um, Absolutely. you actually use them for? Well, so you know what I love is that you never know everything. There's always something to learn. And as much as I love soup and love making socks, I learned two or three things from you today that I oh. didn't know that I'm going to incorporate. Well, I, you know, with the, with the ice, I'm assuming it's just because you wanted to stop the cooking. Mm -hmm. Is that why you would pour in the ice? Okay. Yeah. And the other one was not rushing it. And when you gave the reason why, I completely understood that it's a low process. It's I guess it's like trying to cheat um, caramelizing onions. You think you could turn it up really yes. high and yeah. then you don't get all the sugar out and then you just have the brown <laughs> onion. So I, that was, it was very good. You're a very good teacher. Um, you know, I think that, well, it's a couple of things. As we talked about, I lived in Scotland. It was cold all the time. I made soup every Sunday. We'd have friends around and it was kind of the, just a nice way to, to start the week and in the weekend. Um, and like you, I learned as I started making more soups, how much better it was to make your own stock. Um, and so that's when I kind of really started understanding the whole process. And once you have them, you will like, you'll just never go back. Um, it's, and it, same it's thing, really so much better than game store changer, game changer. And you're right. There's that funny taste to it that you don't know is there until you have fresh. Yeah. Um, but I use it in everything. Like you said, not just soups. I use it for any grains, quinoa, anything that usually calls for rice, whether it's beans, you know, vegetable stock is so much better than water for most things yeah so totally. i need to take some of your tips though because i'm always out of storage space so i love the freezer and um, yeah. little ice cube trays that's a great one and then the smaller ones that's another great one yeah i love those little ones because they're one cup so most recipes call for like an even measure one or two cups um yeah and just plop it out and thaw it and it's it's done it's already measured for well, you well my husband will appreciate that too because i was telling him we need to get another freezer for the garage just for all my big things of soup stock. So maybe we can <laughs> come down into a smaller size and not have to buy an extra freezer. Put a big label on it, stock. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so you guys, if you've got any questions, send them in the Q&A box. I've got a couple coming through. And if you have anything specific that you would like to ask Rhonda, um, please mention that and I will direct it directly to her. Um, the first, one of the questions that I have is, um, the the participant said that she noticed that there's not salt or peppering along the way um and why do you wait to the end for me i usually do not add any salt to my stocks um you're rendering down uh the liquid so much and you're reducing it so much it's very hard to tell what the salt content <clears throat> will be by the time it's finished so you could end up with a super salty product um so I like the purity of um, all the vegetables and the chicken or the beef. And then I add my salt to the dish that I'm actually cooking to beef up the flavors because you, you may be reducing down other things in that dish as well. Um, do you agree with that, Rhonda? Do you do the same thing or do you add salt to yours? You know, I, I do at the end, and but I didn't know why until recently. And um, I think I shared with you, our daughter went to culinary school in Scotland and yeah. was over here and making um, stocks for me. And I went to salt and pepper it. And she's like, mother, no, 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 no. You got to wait until the very end of you're going to use it because same thing. Um, so now she was definitely right. I think I was making mine a little too salty and I wasn't appreciative. Because if you taste it right off the bat, it doesn't have that flavor because as you said, it hasn't had a chance to you know, marry with everything and render all the flavor. Um, so now if I, you know, at the very end, if it needs just a little, I'll do just a pinch of maybe like a flaky sea salt, so just a little bit of pepper, but it's a game changer. But if you start tasting the, the broth at the very beginning, you're, you're like, oh, this needs salt and you have to have patience. So totally yeah, agree. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, um, I don't add the salt largely because I use a lot of stocks to reduce down to make further um, sauces out of them. So once you add, once I add the salt, when it's finished, if I'm going to reduce that down by a half even further, it just, the, all I t end up tasting is the salt. So I found the safest thing for me to do is just to leave it out and then add it as you're actually cooking your dish. I noticed um, that you did put peppercorns in some of yours too, which can impart a really good flavor. I do just the beef. I don't do the chicken. Okay. Um, again, because there are some dishes that I want a mild, a much more milder flavor. Um, so I leave the pepper out. I really only do it in the beef. I think okay. um, 
I think technically, traditionally, pepper is part of a chicken stock. Um, I have just, I just one of my weird things that I do, leaving it out. Well, I'm gonna have patience next time, leave it out and see what kind of flavor I get. Awesome. Um, so somebody asked, why do you remove the fat? Is that removing some of the flavor? Um, I, I, I don't think it adds that much flavor to a stock. I think it makes it a little bit greasier when you're reducing it down to make sauces. Um, it actually makes it harder um, <clears throat> when you are making sauces um, to uh, have your sauces come together and meld together. That grease just starts separating your sauce. So not having it, um, I think imparts a much better product when you're making a, a soup or um, a sauce. Do you skim your fat off as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, and, you know, I guess it was just for me a personal thing. It just, it looks cleaner. It, it, mm -hmm. it looks nicer. Um, and then, you know, you can see sometimes we start getting those bubbles of the fat on top. So I always take that off. And if you've done it right, as you said, you know, you'll have that nice gelatinous mix that you want anyway. But yeah, I definitely skim the fat for sure. Yeah. I've not noticed any loss in flavor. Yeah. And, you know, um, and like you said, I think if you do it slower too, like you said, and you're patient, you don't see nearly as much of the stuff you have to skim off at the end. You really don't. You really don't. And, and to that point, one of the things that I did not say in the video is that when you're making a stock, you always want to start with a cold liquid and bring the temperature up. You never want to put warm or hot liquid into a stock pot and put your ingredients in there um, and try to get it up to a boil quickly. It really takes time. I think it's going back a little bit more to the whole concept of slow living and, and putting a little bit more of yourself into the food that you cook. And I always think that that just imparts such a much better experience and flavor um, when you're serving it to family or guests when you're entertaining. Um, so I, I love making them because I just think it's a fun process. And for me, it's an all day thing. So. Um, Joseph, can I ask you a question? So on the yeah. not using the hot water, is that because you don't want to start the cooking process right away? Or, um, or... So what it does is it actually um, draws out more of the impurities faster. So just to the okay. point that you just made, um, bringing up the temperature too fast, it mostly pulls out much more of the impurities that are in the bone. So um, you'll be skimming and skimming and skimming and skimming and skimming. And the hot water is sort of the same thing, right? Okay, you might bring good. it up slowly, yeah. Okay, um, do, you, do you, Rhonda, make any other stocks other than chicken, beef, or vegetable? Um, I actually, for the first time when um, our daughter was here, because she worked in a um, Indian restaurant after culinary school, makes amazing curries. And so we went and um, we had a bunch of lamb and leftover vegetables, so she did a lamb stock. Mm -hmm. And it was really good. It's, yeah. it was very rich, but really delicate. And, you know, it's some, you know, it's, it was a great flavor, you know, it's a little richer than your chicken, but not quite as rich as a beef stock. And yeah. so um, that was a new one for me. And I think I'll definitely do that one again. Yeah, it was really I, nice. I, what about I, you? I've also made veal stock. Um, mm -hmm. I don't make it often because I don't usually use a lot of um, veal with the bones in it. Um, mm -hmm. But if I have the bones just so that I'm not wasting them, I do make a veal stock, um, which is a little bit lighter than a beef stock. Um, but I, you know, I, I just think beef is so universal that you can use it right. for almost anything. So right. um, I have, I've actually even melded beef bones in with veal bones and done mm -hmm. that sounds one good pot of it too so sounds delicious yeah. and then of You're course me fish, hungry <laughs> fish stock is always great to make too i've not had great luck with fish stock yeah and so maybe it just takes more practice it's but i've not mine hasn't been wonderful yeah i it it really so usually it comes out pretty fairly bland um mm -hmm. i add pickling spices to mine when, oh, I, okay. when I'm making my stock, and that has really helped a tremendous amount. It really- That's a great idea. Okay. It sort of brings up the flavor of the fish somehow. I don't know, but um, I usually add that to mine when I'm making it. I'm going to try that. Yeah. Uh, let's see, another question. I just started making my own stocks recently, so I learned a lot. Can you also use a roasted or cooked chicken, or is it better to use raw? 
Um, it's always better to use raw. Raw is gonna give you more of that very clean chicken flavor that you want. If you're using a roasted bo uh, bones from a chicken, of course, don't waste it, make a stock with it. It's just gonna give it a little bit more of a heartier flavor. Um, much like when you're roasting the bones for the beef stock, it's just, it's really intensifying the flavor of it. So um, I, I rarely use a uh, roasted carcass to make chicken stock. Again, because I use it to make a lot of sauces and when I'm reducing that down, even further than the stock, it now has a really intense flavor. And sometimes I don't want it that deep of a flavor in, into um, a sauce. But how, do you use roasted bones? I, I, I do on one occasion, we have a market buyer place that does amazing rotisserie chickens on Monday. So sometimes it's an easy dinner yeah. um, to pick those up and do a big salad with it. And then I'll throw it into the Instapot with whatever leftover vegetables we have. And I make basically a bone broth just for sipping, yeah. uh, but not for cooking because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a good flavor, but it's more of a sipping bone broth than I'd say it is a stock. And that's the only thing I use mine for. Speaking of Instapot, I also make stocks in an Instapot. Um, it's not my preferred way of making it, but sometimes if I am in a rush and I've got too much to do, um, for me, it's a little too fast and too hot of a cooking process. Um, for the stock, but I've made stocks in one and they come out great. So if you're not somebody who wants to sit around and watch a, a pot boil for six hours, um, don't let that deter you, do it in an Instapot. And I guarantee you when you start understanding the difference of the flavors between a, a store-bought package and what you just made in your kitchen, you will probably not buy store-bought again. I mean, unless you're in a total pinch, but um, you'll find a way to actually make stock and freeze it and save it and use it um, and just have it on hand because it's it's so much better. Yeah, and I think I only ever have used, now that I'm thinking the Insta stock just to make a quick bone broth with the leftover rotisserie chickens. I'm not sure I've ever done it, but you know, I'm kind of like you, I enjoy the process, yeah. seeing it come together, you know, slowly it starts to smell, it starts to take on flavor and color and taste and it's, it's you know, but I'm kind of a geek that way, so. Yeah, me, <laughs> but, me too. And, and that's another great point. Your kitchen smells like the most amazing thing you've ever been in. Um, yes. So it it's really, like right up there with roasting turkey. Yeah, it's a really good smell. <laughs> exactly. And I think it sort of puts you in this mood of wanting to continue to cook something else while all that's cooking. So, yeah. um, and I know for me, um, like I said in the video, um, I will usually, because usually when you have to make stock, you've got to go out and get a carcass. So I usually plan dinner around whatever it is that uh, I want to cook around making those stocks so that I'm not wasting the meat. Um, and even a lot of times the um, skin, I will render down to make some schmaltz, which is really good for frying stuff in. Um, so you can even render down the skin so that you're not wasting that either. Um, but, yeah. but don't put your skin in stock, please. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. When do you remove the fat? Isn't that removing some of the flavor? Oh, um, we already answered that question, but uh, thank you. Are, are there any herbs you omit and use them when you actually go to make the dish? Um, no, I don't omit any herbs when I'm making a stock. Um, I think that imparts a great flavor to the stock. And even if I'm reducing it down, I may add more thyme or another bay leaf to even extract more flavor. Um, so there's not really, uh, I would not omit any herbs, uh, although I use a very basic selection of herbs. I don't add more than just uh, what your typical aromats would be, which is um, thyme, bay leaf, and parsley. Um, I do not make any stocks that contain oregano or anything of that nature. If I'm using that flavor profile, I'll add that when I'm cooking the dish and adding the stock to it. Um, if you're not making your stock straight away, how long, uh, how long can the cones and veggies stay in plastic bags in the freezer? Oh, that's a great question. Do you save your stuff when you, your, your trimmings and stuff to do your stock with when you're cooking? Yeah, I try to, and, uh, but I only keep them for a day or two usually. Um, yeah, I mean, but you know, I'm not afraid to use some that have been in the refrigerator that are starting to look a little like they need to get 
cooked, but well, maybe they're not best for um, serving dinner. Yeah. And uh, and we get the box of like the ugly fruits and vegetables. So a lot of times I'll just throw that in there, but I try not yeah. to waste any of them, you know? And, and I think you, you tell me, I think you can be a little more lenient with the veggies you put in there from the refrigerator that you may not, you know, do glazed carrots for dinner, but you, you can put them in your stock pot. Yeah, and I actually, I freeze mine. So okay. if, I'm not, if I'm not using them right away, I'll freeze them um, in a Ziploc bag with that has paper towel in it. Um, and, you know, I don't leave them in there too long because I, I make stocks every few couple of weeks. So, um, but as I'm trimming, I'll just keep adding to that Ziploc bag in the freezer. And usually I think they last pretty good for about two weeks um, frozen in a Ziploc bag. I, I try to use them up by that time, um, but I, I, I don't mind freezing them. It's, it totally works. I think it, you know, it's one way of kind of not wasting stuff that you have in the kitchen. I agree, waste not, want not. Exactly, and that's part of the, you know, that's one of the real beauties of cooking is that way back before, you know, everybody was about convenience and, mm -hmm quickness and fastness and, and, you know, semi homemade stuff. Um, they didn't waste a thing. They yeah. cook with every part of everything. So. And I think more people are doing that now since the pandemic too. You know, I think it's yeah. at least I, I, it's forced us a lot of people to reconsider how we cook, what we cook, mm -hmm. you know, not to waste, to reconnect with the kitchen. At least I've been made more mindful again of what I cook, what I use, I'd be thankful for what I have because so many right now don't. And so I've been, yeah, it's made me re-examine how I look at what I cook and not letting things go to waste. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I have a question for you because this question is kind of leads into something that I heard you mention, which is uh, speaking of different kinds of salts, there's so many kinds. Can you comment on which ones, what the differences are in some of them? and like I know you mentioned, I think you said you use Maldon salt or something at the end for flavoring yours. Or sometimes even you know, like a like a really, um, I mean, they're expensive, but you know, the, the French sea salt, because they're very, mm -hmm. um, they're just not, not as salty. It's not like, you know, a white table salt, um, and, yeah. but it's expensive, but just a little goes a long way and it just gives it that nice, tastes like the sea, but without being overly salty. That's usually what I use or just, because some salts and you know, and I think, I think you just have to try them, right? Because there are so many different yeah. ones, but some definitely impart a much saltier flavor. I always just like that little hint of sea flavor. It, yeah, it's it's amazing the difference in, you know, regular table sea salt. I think because it's iodized, um, just has that stinging sort of mm -hmm. almost bitterness to it if you get too much of it. I never use table salt in any of my cooking, um, period. Um, I either use a kosher salt or my favorite is Maldon salt, which is a, mm -hmm. it's a flaky sea salt that you um, flavor with at the end of cooking, not during cooking. Um, but I think like uh, you said, Rhonda, experiment with your salt um, and, you know, don't get away from table salt, like just get it out of your cabinet um, and experiment with some other types of salt out there. Um, I know for me, like I bake a lot. And when I bake, I don't use table salt. I use fine sea salt and it's a little bit more expensive, but I swear the flavor of my baked goods is, yeah. it's almost like it, it amplifies the flavor 10 times. Um, mm -hmm. So, but again, uh, my recommendation would be if you're gonna um, experiment with salt, do it at the end of the cooking process of the stock or your sauce or your soup um and add a little bit of a time that's how you bring up the flavor in something add it little at a time stir it in and keep tasting and you'll start to feel the flavors sort of build up as you uh add more and more and more um and you'll sort of recognize when you get to the point that okay this is enough i need to stop um let's see have you ever served a risotto with chicken stock to someone who is a vegetarian? Have you ever served a risotto <laughs> with chicken stock? I hope I have. A vegetarian. Um, uh, you know what? I try to be, I mean, uh, just because we have people in the family, so I try to be sensitive to it. 
I hope I have it. I don't, not, not knowingly. I, I'll say that, but not knowingly. Yeah, I, I don't think I have. I usually make my risottos with vegetable stock. Um, almost for that very reason. It's sort of an old catering thing when I had my catering business. Um, it's another opportunity to have a vegetarian dish um, mm -hmm. that you may not otherwise have had. So I tend to always make my risottos with a vegetable stock just for that reason. You know, if I'm entertaining and oops, someone walks through the door and I didn't know they were a vegetarian, I can still give them some, you know, a hearty component of the meal um, without feeling like I've got to go in and create something completely new for them. Um, yeah, that's a but, good idea. Yeah. Um, and another person asked, um, so they think they may have overcooked their stock because it solidified in um, the fridge. And so it was more concentrated. Um, so I don't think that that's a, a product of overcooking your stock. Um, I think you just rendered it down even more than what's necessary. Um, and that almost turns into more of a bone broth than it does a stock, right? A bone broth is a very condensed version of a stock. So I don't think you did anything wrong. And I think once you heat it up, it's going to liquefy again. Um, it may be too intense in flavor for whatever you're using and you can add a little bit of water to um, dilute it. Uh, but you may really like that concentrated flavor. Um, I will say that from that perspective, if you're making sauces, that thickness will really help to thicken a sauce for a dish. So um, don't feel like you did something wrong. It totally was fine. And do you make bone broths? I do. I make a lot of bone broth, but then I was going to say I will dilute them with a little water or depending mm -hmm. on what I'm making, a little bit of um, lemon juice um, just to, to give it a, you know, a little bit of flavor. But you can definitely um, dilute it with water, lemon juice, even a white wine. But I make, but I personally drink a lot of bone broth, so I like it. Um, and yeah. so I do. But I think that when she said that I, or you said that, I think that's exactly probably what happened. Just you got more of the stuff from the bone that makes it more gelatinous, gelatinous. and solidified. Yeah. 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 And actually it's, good for you. <laughs> it's super healthy for you. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. And so our last question is, oh, another one just came through. Awesome. If you make soup for a party, say of eight, do you use your frozen stash of stock or do you make it all fresh? Um, so you're sort of the soup wizard. How do you do it, Rhonda? Do you do you use your stocks or do you start from fresh? Um, you know what, honestly, this is going to sound like the lazy answer, but I think it would just depend on how much time I had. I mean, just because mm -hmm. it is a time intensive process. So, um, you know, I might make it the day before and then use it the next day because it, it does take time. Once you've been doing it all day, then to start making your soups could be time consuming. Um, yeah. But honestly, they're, they're still so flavorful, whether they've been in the refrigerator a day or two or even in the freezer. I don't tend to find that they lose their their flavor. Um, but I would honestly, the answer is I probably did the day before. <laughs> yeah, um, I, think, I, I think I've done it both ways as well. I mean, I think if I'm making a soup, sometimes I will just start from scratch and then sometimes I'll pull the stock out of the freezer, which it re still requires some cooking for the soup. Um, but it's, it's a much quicker process. Of course, I've used most of my stock at that point, but um, I think I've done it both ways too. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for that. Um, so, and I don't think you get a different product out of doing either one either way, right? So. Flavor wise. I've never noticed, yeah. The only benefit is if you have the time, it makes the house smell even better. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're at uh, we're all finished up, you guys. Rhonda, I wanted to thank you for coming and joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me. So this has been fun. Have you. Yes, let's um, do this in person one day after quarantine. We'll make soup together. I would love if we could do a live soup and stock class together. That would be great. There you go. Um, you guys, be sure to check out Rhonda online on Instagram. Rhonda, what is your Instagram? Can you tell them? It's Rhonda underscore Carmen, R-O-N-D-A underscore C-A-R-M-A-N. Awesome. So check her out on Instagram and Facebook. And if you have not purchased one of her books yet, go and search them, Entertaining at Home or Designers at Home. They're both two really fabulous books. And of course, you. You can, if you've missed any part of the video, you can see it on 
Aspire's website next week and also on my YouTube page at Home with Joseph. If there are any other questions that we didn't get to or you're making some stock at home and you have a question or you're not sure what to do, um, feel free to uh, message me on Instagram. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And if you want to send me any questions for Rhonda, I'll forward them to her um, and see if she can answer them for us. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, you guys. Stay safe in all that snow. It's a balmy 70 here in Florida. I'm sorry, but, um, but thank you. Gotta for get the kitchen to make soup now. Yeah, exactly. Thanks and Rhonda, for, thank you. Thanks I really for inspiring it. us. Thank I will you. thank you. I'm inspired, so thank you. So happy to have you. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye.